All right. We are going to get back to this uh, subject of fighting. Uh, but uh, before we do that, just uh, before we cross the Jordan, enter into battle, uh, we want to consider something. It's a very, it's actually a curious part of our study. Uh, maybe, maybe this would have been beneficial to do earlier than this, but uh, watch the screen. And this is going to give you uh, at least the intended. It's it's not perfect. It's just a, a glimpse of the intended journey that Israel was to take out of Egypt uh, and into the promised land. So obviously here is Egypt. This is where they were, this whole area. Here's the Red Sea. And this is the desert. This is the wilderness. And here is uh, the promised land. So that's where they were going. So there you go. They left. They crossed over the Red Sea, they go through the wilderness, and then they finally arrive right there at the Jordan River. On the other side of the Jordan River is the promised land. And when it comes to speaking of the Jordan River in terms of the Christian, as well as the promised land, in fact, it even happened here. Patty mentioned it, and it's totally like, it's okay. It's totally cool. I just want to like, uh, I think someone else mentioned it too. A lot of times, uh, you hear the Jordan River being symbolized as something. You hear um, the promised land being uh, uh, picturing something. And I kind of have a bit of a complaint about it because uh, it just it just doesn't quite fit as well. But I, I totally get it. See if you can hear in this song what the Jordan River is often thought of as. Uh, these are some songs that I know. Sometimes I read it in books. I hear it in songs. Um, and... See if you can catch what the Jordan River is being referred to, what the promised land is being referred to. See if you can hear it. The first song is, and may, I could probably sing it. You probably know these ones. And when my task on earth is done, when by grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. All right, here's the next one. Near the cross, I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever, till I reach the golden strand just beyond the river. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Last one. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust your promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within your holy word. Help me, Lord. When toil and trouble meeting, error to take us from a father's hand, one by one, the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. And what is what's being what what is the Jordan? What is the promised land? The Jordan is the divider between earth and the heavenly world. Yeah. So That's the promised land would be the promised heaven. Land would be heaven. And what would the Jordan be? The Jordan death. death. Yeah, death. Yeah. So this, I hear this, it's very, it, it's probably more immediate for us to think of like the promised land as heaven and the Jordan as death. And apparently, you know, some Christians would think that the rich and blessed life, that abundant life, that fat life will not be ours until after we die. And thus the language, oh, I'm in the wilderness and one day I'll cross the river and I'll get to the other side and then I'll have life. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just not. Go ahead, Elijah. Didn't like Joshua cross the Jordan? Isn't that more? Isn't the Jordan more like a, almost like the battle in your life? Like uh, my dad, I the best of my life time, like crossing the Jordan. Jordan wasn't necessarily death. Right. It's just like the struggles you will have uh, to be able to, you know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> You know, so this idea of like only having a uh, lane hold on eternal life when we get to heaven and I have to go through the Jordan through death in order to get in. Like, that's just not what we're seeing. And I'm going to show some proof for that. Um, it, um, so if someone believes that, if someone believes that you're, you're not really going to get into the land until after you die, then basically they're saying, I spend my life in the wilderness. Now, if life kind of seems like a wilderness, well, <laughs> okay, we get that. And there's a place and a time for the wilderness. In fact, that's what our last two sessions are going to be on tomorrow. I know it's kind of going backwards, but um, the last two sessions are just, they might be some of my favorite things to talk about 
Uh, so tomorrow, the last two sessions, we're going to talk about the reason for the wilderness, the purpose for the wilderness. But the whole time that we're here on earth, we're not supposed to be spending it in the wilderness. We should cross the Jordan and go in and take the land. Brothers, let me tell you this. If we don't lay hold on eternal life until after we die, it, it, shame on us. It's sad to think, I don't, it's sad to just think that there's people that we know that even it might be some of us even in this room, just as sad that there are think that some who, who will not go in. If that's the case, then the Jordan River will be illustrative of physical death for you. You're going to go in, okay? You're going in. Eternal life is yours. It's your possession. And if that's when you go in, when you die, because you never went in and fought for it in this life, you'll go in because <laughs> you're going to heaven. And in that sense, the promised land is like heaven. It's where we're going to spend our, our eternity. Um, and if you wait until you die to go in, you're not going to have to fight for it then. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> but why would we wait? To go in. Yeah, Patty. So I have a question that's not really related to what we're just talking about now, but about there's a journey to go ahead. I think you're very wise, like if there's a reason why they went down, like across the red seeing in the wounds, like maybe you're just like God's choice, like like to have them go down there so you're like uh I don't know how's the word or like you know, uh, all bad things like kind of good things through him, like uh point him pretty much. Or like, why they just go up and like through like the mm -hmm. rest and like stuff right there and just go right into the promised land? So go mm -hmm. yeah, to yeah, the promised land. Yeah, that's actually what the last two sessions we're going to look at tomorrow is to explain what was God doing in the wilderness. What was He like? What's the reason why? And the trip, the initial trip was two years. It turned into 40, yeah. but uh, it was supposed to be a lot quicker than it was. It still was going to take time because there was a purpose for it. And we'll look at that tomorrow. Micah. Yeah, I've heard that before. Because there are lots of I've seen maps of it. I, I feel like it was here when one of the speakers brought up that there were like a bunch of way easier routes for the Israelites to take rather than to go through the Red Sea itself, which is much wider. I don't see it being see much, uh, much more narrow up towards the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And then also... I think there are a lot of people, if you just jump straight across, bad, bad people, if you go straight across. There's a map that you show, little pocket of Philistines that you can't yeah. get rid of. Well, that pocket's a whole lot bigger here. And like, just historically, people are on the curse. Right? Yes. That's what trades. There is a, there is like a, a, a clear statement in the Bible that says the Lord did not want to lead them that way lest they see war and be discouraged and want to go back to, to Egypt. So that's one reason is like if he led them straight across there, they would be engaged in warfare sooner than they were ready for it. And they would want to go back to Egypt. They still wanted to go back to Egypt, even though they didn't go that way. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of bad on the Patrick's. I feel like God sent them that way to kind of test their faith, show them their real struggles, what they would have to go to get to the real promised land and kind of see who would want to turn back and first and who would actually turn back. Yeah. And well, that is what we're going to look at tomorrow. So we're going to look at, and, and I don't want to give too much away because yeah. some of what you're saying is what we're going to look at tomorrow. So that's, that's good. Kind of, that's that's good. kind of what it looks like to me. Yeah. Like just <laughs> looking at that map. Because why would God set him a straight line and make it yeah. the easiest way possible? Everyone would go. Yeah. Yeah. If God has beautiful design, uh, incredible purpose and things. Because even now, God still tests our faith all the time. Yeah. And sin tests our faith. Satan tests our faith. And we have to fight. That That's right. That always comes in. Well, that land, that eternal life is what we are going to enjoy forever. It's what we're going to enjoy in heaven. Guys, you're not going to get another life, okay? The eternal life that you have now is what you're going to have for all eternity. And you're going to get a new body, but the eternal life that you've been given now, the spiritual life is the same life that you will have for all eternity. And it's already been given to you now. That's what's so incredible about the kindness of God that he doesn't make us wait to own it. He doesn't make us wait to lay hold on it. 
um, it's something, it's really the life of heaven. And it's the life of heaven now. If you want to look forward more to heaven, then live the life of heaven. Enter into what it is that makes heaven heaven, eternal life and all the blessings of God. Start to taste and just see those things even now. And we were talking after the, the last session, like if you want to feel the way you're supposed to feel in this world and like you're a stranger and you're a sojourner and you're a pilgrim and you don't belong here and you're not home, if you want to feel more the reality of that, then enter into more of the life of heaven and you'll feel more and more like, I really get a strong sense that I don't belong here. And when we get to heaven, I hope we are not too shocked at all the reality of this. And I don't know if you've ever heard of the term permagrin, but it, it, as the permagrin comes on <laughs> and we're just, it means like permanently grinning. Uh, for all eternity, on account of all the beauties and the riches of eternal life, we sigh a bit. It's because the blessings that we're going to enjoy there, we could have enjoyed them now and here in measure, but we could have enjoyed them now and here. You know, my testimony is I grew up in a Christian home and I just uh, wasted a lot of time. Uh, just, I was utterly fascinated by things of the world. I was more into music than was proper. Uh, basically an idolater, just loved secular music and uh, kind of gave my life over to it in measure and just went away from the Lord. And coming back to the Lord and beginning to grow in my faith and to begin to lay hold on eternal life, I look back and I'm like, man, I wish I had started sooner. <laughs> and I, I think that I could prob probably say that when I get to heaven, I get to heaven, and even though I have all eternity to enjoy eternal life, I still might say, I wish I had started sooner, because it's so grand, it's so wonderful, and when I realized that I could have, and should have, and had the opportunity, the ability to enter into it sooner, like, man, I could have been in on this <laughs> earlier than this, but if, you know, it's yours, guys. And if Jordan has to be death to you, you'll go in. You'll go in. But uh, you shouldn't have to wait till death. Now, I'm going to be really impressed if somebody knows who this is. Wow. Who said that? Nice, Micah. Switchfoot. Uh, I was so into these guys. Even when I was living here, I used to live here. I lived here for three and a half years at the White House up there. I was the caretaker slash manager. And I remember getting their album, the beautiful letdown. I was so blown away with it. I must have listened to it like a hundred times. But these guys, they have they have this in their songs. It's you find it scattered throughout their lyrics. This idea that they they grab it. And this is one of their songs that says, "I wonder why would I wait till I die to come alive? Why would I wait till I die to come alive?" And so the promised land is like that's where life is. That's abundant life. That's eternal life. Why am I going to make the Jordan death and not really live until I die? I'm ready now. I'm not waiting for the afterlife. And I just, guys, please don't wait till the afterlife. Don't wait till you die to really come alive. Don't make the Jordan, like many of the songs, speak of physical death. But just so you know, guys, if you set your mind to cross the Jordan and go take the land, and if you're not, if you're willing to just, yeah, you're not willing to wait until you die, you, you know by now, you're going to have to fight for it. And that truth, that truth that you're going to have to fight for it is an excellent bit of evidence that crossing the Jordan into the promised land is not best understood as the Christian dying and entering into heaven. That's a good bit of evidence. Double shaking there. You are going to face opposition. You are going to face opposition. This is a very good reason why, very good evidence that crossing the Jordan into the promised land is not meant to picture to us dying and getting into heaven. Because if you and I die and we get to heaven and there's somebody there trying to keep us out, it's going to be really disappointing. It's going to be really discouraging to be like, oh my goodness. I've died. I'm now in heaven and there's Jericho <laughs> and there's armies, nations greater and mightier than me that I got to fight. 
it's that detail in particular that helps us to know, wait a second, maybe, maybe I need to be looking at this type in a different way. Maybe the Jordan isn't dead. Maybe the promised land is not best viewed as heaven, but more as eternal life, because I can't really enter heaven right now, but I sure can enter into eternal life right now if I'm really willing to fight for it. You see this, right? You see this. Joshua, when Joshua went into the land, he had to fight for it. He had to fight for it. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Maybe, uh, Josiah, would you read uh, verses 1 to 6, Deuteronomy 7, 1 to 6. This is before they go in. This is Moses telling them what's going to happen when they go in and that they're going to have to fight. They knew, they knew very clearly they were going to have to fight. They were told that. So verses 1 to 6 of Deuteronomy 7. All right. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Gergesites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Well done. Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show any mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou go make marriages unto them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give to his son, or his daughter shalt thou take as uh, unto thy son. But they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, and break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Mm. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people. For you were fewest in of all the people. Okay. Now, uh, Victor, I was just thinking that goes to that passage you were reading in, in Peter, I think, right? <laughs> Uh, you're a special treasure, chosen people, a holy people. And there's a lot in here that you might want to make comment on. Uh, but the main thing I'll put up on the screen here is just is this uh, the point that there are seven nations greater and mightier than you that are in the land that I'm giving you. Seven nations greater and mightier than you. They don't want you in there. They will fight to keep you out. They will join together, they will combine their armies, and they will look to destroy you. You're going to have to fight them. We might say that these enemies are all those things which might prevent you from enjoying eternal life, even principalities and powers in heavenly places. Satan himself, he's a roaring lion. He is looking to destroy. He's looking to devour. We have the flesh. We have the world. And it's not like we're going to be able to utterly destroy them in an absolute sense like, like we read here, but that we are well able to overcome them. We are well able to gain the victory over them, but make no like doubt about it. We do have to fight them. I love uh, when John, uh, the apostle, is writing in First John. He says, I write to you, young men. Now, he's writing to children, too, and he's writing to fathers. So there's a point in time when we're children. There's a point in time when we're young men. And then we become fathers. What does he say to the young men? They're not children anymore. They're young men. He says, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. You have overcome the wicked one. You went into battle. <laughs> you went into battle and you overcame the wicked one. Oh, just the, 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 the the strength that is there for us to be able to overcome these enemies, although we will absolutely have to fight them. Let us just take care to know how we do that, though, because we saw something in this passage that we read that's essential to understand. It's in verse 2. It says, when the Lord your God delivers them over to you. 
when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, <laughs> you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them when the Lord your God delivers them over to you. We're going to talk more about this, but I want you to go to another place to read. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 9. Maybe, Patty, you could read that. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses, verses. verses 1 to 3. Yeah. Hear, O Israel, who are crossing over the Jordan today to go and to dispossess the nation greater and mightier than you. Great cities fortified in heaven. A people great and tall, the sons of Anakim, who you know and of and of and of which you have heard it said, you have stand before the sons of Anakim. Know therefore today that it is the Lord your God who is crossing over before you at a consuming fire. <laughs> he will destroy them and will subdue them before you, so that you so that you may drive them out and destroy them quickly, just as the Lord has spoken to you. So they are going to go have, have to go in and fight, but look at what they're being told ahead of time. And this is what we need to know ahead of time too. The Lord is going over before you. And I love this. Like, in, I have a little, I have a wide, wide margin Bible and it allows me to put in notes on the side, right? So right next to this, I actually forgot that I put this there. I just noticed it right now as we were reading when it says, he who goes over before you, he goes over before you as a consuming fire. I just put, wow. <laughs> wow. The Lord is like going over like a fire ready to consume those who would oppose us. He will destroy them and bring them down before you. So it's, they're, they're still involved in the process, guys. They're still involved in the fighting, but the Lord is bringing them down. So you shall drive them out. You shall drive them out and destroy them quickly. Oh. What an awesome thought he is going to pour you. We will have to fight if we're going to go in, but the Lord is with us. And through him, we shall battle like valiantly, successfully. I love when uh, the children of Israel came out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea and they saw all the Egyptians dead. And they sang that song. One of the things they said is the Lord is a man of war. I mean, when they saw the mighty Egyptians all dead and they saw the Lord just took care of that, they're like, the Lord is a man of war. He's a warrior. And you got to check this out. Uh, go to Joshua chapter five. And don't worry, we're going to have some conversations. So if you've got thoughts that are developing here, we'll, we'll give you a chance to share them. The chapter five. Joshua chapter five. And maybe Kevin, you'd read this. Which verses? Verses 13 to 15, Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. Let me just set you up for what we're about to read here. They've crossed the Jordan. They haven't fought their first battle. Jericho is waiting. It's a mighty city with mighty men, uh, and they are going to have to engage in battle very quickly after crossing the Jordan. Before they go into their first battle, this scene happens, um, verses 13 to 15 of Joshua 5. When Joshua, Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his strong sword in his hand. And Jericho went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped worship and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Oh, man. So, guys, this, yeah. <laughs> this is the Lord. This is the Lord incarnate. We call it a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. The evidence to that is that the place in which this one is standing is holy. It reminds us of when Moses was by the burning bush and the place where he was standing was holy and said, take off your shoes. This is the Lord. He is the commander of the army of the Lord. It's just what a, a like a title. And there he is standing there with his sword out. And Joshua sees him. Says, are you for us or for our enemies? He's the commander of the army of the Lord. And before they go in to fight their first battle, he makes an appearance and shows himself to, the, to Joshua. Here's the one that's going in. This is the angel even that was told that would go before them. This is the Lord who will fight for them. And he makes an appearance. I wonder what you think of this appearance of this. 
I, I've got some pictures to show you. <laughs> um, different artists rendering of what they think this commander of the army of the Lord look like. Uh, pretty spectacular, some of them, like this one. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wonder if this is going to be like one of these pictures like, oh, we know, we all know what that's from. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's like, uh, if that's what he really looked like. I thought this one was pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, imagine if he turned and saw this guy. I mean, that looks more like Hell's Angel. <laughs> well, I don't know, but uh, light and, uh, and uh, fierce wolves and muscles and beards. And uh, but he doesn't have his sword quite out yet. It looks like he's getting ready to draw it. But but you know what? It probably was more more realistically like the next two pictures. Probably was more more subdued than that. More like this. There's Joshua looking and he sees a a man with his sword drawn and he doesn't know who he is. I mean, his response if he had saw the other two guys, <laughs> like man. <laughs> but he just talks to him like, "Who are you? Are you for us or for our enemies?" So it lends itself to. You know, when when this might be a little uh, uh, pop your balloon about when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, I, I think he just looked like a man, guys. He just looked like a man. I uh, didn't like <laughs> some of these paintings, right? This huge, glorious scene of an angel with wings and all this light filling the room. I think that the angel that announced the birth of the baby Jesus to, to Mary, it was a man. He looked like a man. Um, we could go into that, but it's uh, perhaps most realistic is this next picture. It's probably the most subdued picture of it all. Uh, but so, was someone gonna say something? Yeah, doesn't he always start off his catchphrase, Do not be afraid? Yes, if we're talking about how Joshua being like in generalization, then it's not really ready to do it. Do not be afraid. I mean, maybe if the angel gave a little, you know, an angel style just like appeared in Mary's house, I guess. That yeah, happens. this is like more of like, yeah, I feel like you might know, yeah. Like, yeah, well, there might be something different about him, but it's not going to be like like some of these images. I don't think it's going to be. There's something different, uh, but it's a man. We think about. I was I was going to refrain from this, but you remember uh, how Abraham saw the Lord and two angels walking, and they just appeared like some food for them and served them. Yes, Elijah, you can feel their presence. Yeah, Elijah. Don't angels also like like we don't know much about angels. Maybe at least when they appear to us, I think that that's generally what you're going to see. It. Like if you study it, it seems like when they appear to us, they have the appearance of a, of a human body. But it doesn't mean that that's, you know, they're flying around. They're in the spirit world. <laughs> There's something different when they're like not appearing to us. Are you going to say something, Josiah? Uh, Ezekiel uh, show. Yes, that's right. Point. That's right. Very good. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, six wings, some of them, you know, eyes. four wings, eyes all over the place. Yeah, very good, Josiah. Thank you. Yeah. So it's not only that they, they appear like men. They sometimes are like. Yeah, and there's different types of angels, yeah. But maybe this one is like, I know it's the most least spectacular, but I just think of uh, just, yeah, yeah, he's just, just, just first like, and a sword drawn. It might not have been much more spectacular than, than just, just this man uh, who had his sword drawn. And uh, um, I mean, it's interesting when you think of, the book of Revelation, when we come to fight the battle of Armageddon, Jesus is wearing a robe and all of us are clothed in white. Right? You know, where, where's the fierceness of like, you know, uh, you know, all this kind of armor and swords and things. I mean, yes, the Lord's face is shining like the sun and there's a sword coming out of his mouth. <laughs> and that's always good. But uh, it's like, it's just sometimes our, our preconceived ideas, uh, just like we like to make it more compelling gripping imagery I mean, but it might have just been simple like this so if you think about it, in the old testament the lord's presence was so powerful they had to cover it with smoke because you looked at him directly he would just evaporate he died yeah, they they didn't want to look right at the glory of the lord that is for sure just die yeah because the sin was our sin filled our hearts you couldn't see him you wouldn't couldn't look at it yeah. even highest priests 
Yep. You have to be careful. Ones, yeah. The only ones allowed back there, they still mm -hmm. can end up in heaven. But just remember that it says about Moses that he spoke to the Lord face to face. Um, so there's a place for thinking that way too. And I think that would be a pre-incarnate Christ as well. Um, but listen to this before I get to the next slide. Yeah, he does. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, maybe we can just read this. Deuteronomy chapter 3, uh, verses 21 and 22. And maybe Elijah, maybe you'd read this. Deuteronomy 3, 21 and 22. Deuteronomy 3, 21 and 22. There's a phrase in here. I just love it. <laughs> I almost was going to skip it, but we got to do it. Yeah. 21 and 22. And I commanded Joshua at that time, your eyes have seen all the Lord your God has done these two kings. So will the Lord do to you all, to all the kingdoms into which you are crossing. You shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. Mm -hmm. It is the Lord your God who fights for you. Don't be afraid. It's, <laughs> do not fear. There's seven nations greater and mightier than you. You're going to go in. You're going to fight. But the Lord your God himself fights for you. And we just see this presence of the commander of the army of the Lord before they ever fight their first battle. And I love what Joshua and Caleb say. They kind of, I don't know, they kind of talk a little bit of smack when they talk to the rest of Israel. They're, they're just like the wording that they use when they're talking about these enemies that they have to go in and fight. They're confident. They know the Lord is going in with them. And this is what they say. They are our bread. <laughs> I love it, you guys. I love this phrase. They are our bread. It's kind of like saying, we are just going to eat them. We're going to eat them up. They're our bread. Like we're going to devour them. I mean, maybe try this one on the basketball court, you know, when you're playing like, you're my bread, <laughs> you know, just use it. Like you're, <laughs> or, or do all King James, thou art my bread. <laughs> Go on uh, to Psalm 44 real quick. Uh, Psalm 44. Psalm 44, this is like years later. Um, this is a psalm talking about Israel going into the land and having to fight for it and how they succeeded. And what's cool about this psalm is not only are they reflecting back on the way things were back in the days of Moses and Joshua, but they personalize it and they learn from it. They, they, they say, this is how I'm going to do it. This is the way they did it. And I'm going to learn from it. And this is the way I'm going to do it. So you and I want to make this psalm uh, personal as well. Psalm 44, verse 1 says, We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but you planted, but them you planted. That means planted them in the land. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out. And look at this. Look what they say. For they, that's their ancestors. That's the, the, those in the days of Joshua. They did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance because you favored them. That's grace. <laughs> you are my king, O oh God. Command victories for Jacob. This is like, you guys just like maybe say this in the morning when you get up, you're like, Lord, command victories for Scott. <laughs> I'm going out like, just command victories for me today. Command victories for me today. Through you, we will push down our enemies. And you see the adjustment there? You see the, the transition that was made? First, they were talking about their ancestors and how they succeeded and what they did. But now the psalmist is saying, this is how we're going to do it. Through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your names, we will trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. In God, we boast all day long and praise your name forever. <laughs> Guys, if you see any Christian that you would say has laid hold on eternal life is it, and is living in the land, you can be guaranteed of this. 
They fought the fight of faith in order to lay hold on it. That is true. But with a complete reliance on the Lord. There's just simply no way to take the land on our own strength. You want to lay hold on eternal life. You cannot do it on your own strength. And I love this psalm for that reason. They look back at the ancestors and say, well, those are seven nations greater and mightier than them. How did they do it? They didn't rely on their own strength. They relied on the Lord and that's how they did it. And then they're like, hey, that's how I'll do it. <laughs> that's how I'll do it. And that's what each one of us wants to say. We want to recognize how they did it. And then we want to say, even if we're looking at someone around us, if we there's people in our church and we look up to them and we say, man, that person is like clearly living in the land. They're joyful. They're peaceful. They're strong. They're their life is vibrant. You know that how, how they did that. They did not do it on their own strength. And neither are you. Neither am I. We're not going to be able to do this on our own strength. I do have some uh, time for a conversation, but let me just give you a few verses here to help us know this. Oh, I guess I put this up. <laughs> I forgot about this. Any Christian is living a little tough. But here's some great verses uh, to just, guys, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I think so. Yeah, probably. <laughs> you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then the Lord Jesus' words himself. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And I'll, just a quote, and then I'm going to open up for your comments on this. Um, there's this author, he said this. The confidence which dispenses with continued dependence on God is worthless and a delusion of the enemy. The confidence which dispenses with continued dependence on God is worthless and a delusion of the enemy. Guys, like, we needed the Lord to come out of Egypt. We need the Lord to get through the wilderness. And we need the Lord to take hold of the land. No matter where we are, we have to rely on the Lord. We need to depend on him. And if we do, we can do well. We can really succeed in our battle. So what do you think? Any thoughts just about this, about going in and fighting, but relying on the Lord and on his strength and having that confidence of just being like, there are bread, <laughs> there are bread. I can, I can do this with the Lord's help. I can be successful. I can overcome the enemy and I can take the land. Any thoughts just on that? Yes, with like Joshua, I was thinking about I guess I'm just thinking about the, you know, how often in Joshua he gets told to, you know, be strong and courageous. Mm, yeah, so, like, yeah. even though he had God on his side, even he, he kind of sometimes lost a little bit. But in the end, you know, he did, you know, trust God and, you know, keep going. Yeah. And they had such victory. I, I'm going to skip this part, but if you want to read this on your own, just a, a taste of their victory, Joshua 11, 1 to 8. It's just like, and this king was defeated. And this king was defeated. And this king was defeated. It's just like a list of like one victory after another, after another. So like Josiah's right. Like jo jo that's exactly how Joshua had success. He just went in, trusted the Lord. And the Lord gave him one victory after another. Uh, I think it's like not straight from that. Um, I think of the story of um, Aiken, uh, all the Jericho, they're going on to um, mm -hmm. AI. And the Lord says, don't take the riches from Jericho. Leave them be, but he can seize them. He takes them behind to his tent. Yeah, yeah. And so the Israelites go up to Ai. They're like, okay, this is a smaller city. We'll send, I think, only a couple thousand men to go in and take it. It'll be, it'll be lighter. And then they go in. I think like 40 or something went out killed with the rest. Turn away. And you can see just a complete 180 yeah. from Jericho to Ai. All the guys in Jericho, they listen like very good every yeah. instruction they carry out to a T and then because of their disobedience yeah. they were delivered over to Peter. Yeah, yeah. And you know what's interesting about that story is what Joshua tells them 
or uh, what Moses tells them. He says, uh, or no, actually, I'm thinking of, uh, and I'm thinking of the, the second attempt to enter into the land after they didn't go in. But just the idea that the Lord is not with them. Like, don't, don't go. You're going to lose. Unless the Lord is with you, you're going to lose. And they went up and tried to do it without the Lord. They tried to do it without the Lord and they failed. Yeah. If the Lord is not with us, like when they went up to AI, the Lord was not with them to give victory. And so as Micah brings up, um, they suffered defeat. Yeah. And every time you remind me of all these fights and defeats and losses and wins, it keeps reminding me of the Goliath fight. Mm -hmm. and Goliath killed so many soldiers and it was David that came out, right? With just a sling and a rock. Yeah. Except for one rock. And Jesus sent that rock straight mm -hmm. in the middle of his head and dropped him. Yeah. From his feet onto the ground. Yeah. Yeah. You would never expect that from a kid to do that. Yeah. He's just a kid, just a young guy. That's maybe, I don't know, maybe your age. I don't know. Like, he was like young. And it's like everyone expected that to fail. It just kind of bounce off. And why did he why did he have the victory? Because he did what? Because he believed. Yeah, he relied on the Lord, right? He, yeah. The Lord gave the victory. All these other yeah. fighters were relying on their strength and that they can overpower. Goliath relied on his strength. That's right. That's power. right. David called out to the Lord. Yeah. He actually relied on yeah. Jesus and he relied on the Lord. And he's like, today the Lord will give the victory and I will take your head off of you and I will feed your flesh to the birds. <laughs> like, it's just like, you are my right now. <laughs> that's what he could have said goliath you are my like, friend there's a lot of stories like in the bible it's like yeah. the one verse to many yeah this is that the lord is teaching all throughout the bible listen if you trust in me and as mike is bringing up which we're going to get to is the idea of obedience too that's our part but if you trust in me like man there's not a victory that the lord isn't <laughs> able to give to us i i know i'm i know i'm running out of time here and i just I wonder if I should do this quote. Oh, this, oh, I, I know, right? <laughs> said there was no small print. <laughs> I know, right? So maybe I'll, I'll skip that. Let's see. Because I want it, what I want to finish up with, we got like just the five or 10 more minutes. By the way, it's a great phrase right there. Giants and grapes are usually found together. Giants, uh, grapes and giants are usually found together. If you want the grapes, you might find some giants you got to fight. So anyway. Uh, I want to finish up with this and conversation just on, on this. Ephesians chapter 6, this is where we'll end our session. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 6. Even though the Lord is going in with us and he's the one that gives us the victory, we're going to start at verse 10. What's that? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 I think it's because he's looking it up on his laptop he wants to find uh, but I will tell you what the verses are <laughs> um, Ephesians chapter 6 we'll start at verse 10 uh, even though the Lord is going with us there's the commander of the army of the Lord ready for the first battle that we're going to fight and he's going to fight for us uh, as long as we're trusting in him and obeying him he will fight for us even though that's the case guys Joshua still had a sword in his hand. Joshua still had a sword in his hand. I want you to think about this very like vividly because I think it's important. When they went into battle, he had some guy standing right in front of him with a sword trying to kill him. He was in like real intense, requiring his strength, requiring his ability, requiring his attentiveness. He was in there, like right up in the grill of somebody else that was trying to kill him. And so was every one of, of the other Israelites. They had to exert strength. They had to pull their swords out of their sheaths. They had to go into the battle. They had to fight. They had to fight. But they had to rely on the Lord while they did that. But they had to fight. And that's... That's something that we want to recognize. We can't just sit back on the couch eating potato chips and expect to enter into the land. Like we got to do what it is the Lord is requiring of us. He says, this is your responsibility. This is what I'm putting on you. Now, if I just put that on you and I didn't help you, you wouldn't be able to do anything. But I put this on you. I require this of you. And I give you the ability and I will be with you and you can do it. But you need to do, if I could say it this way, your part. 
Joshua and Israel, they did their part. They picked up their swords. They engaged the armies in battle, and they fought. And if we're going to do that, well, obviously, why we're here is we're going to need some armor. Maybe I'll put up this first picture here. These are from some old books, <laughs> some old books. Uh, so uh, uh, anyways, let's uh, let's read this Ephesians 6, um, verse 10. Uh, maybe someone would read verse 10 to uh, verse 14. Uh, go to ver uh, verse 13. All right, Aiden. And then someone else read 14 uh, to 18. Finally, my wait, wait, hold on. Who's going to do 14 to 18? All right, John, got it. Okay, go ahead. Finally, my friends, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wills of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principles abilities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age against the spiritual hosts of wickedness and the heavenly places therefore take up the whole armor of god that you may be able to withstand in the devil I and mean, the evil day and having done all to stand then therefore having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you are, will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication, all the saints. You can stop there. That's good. Thank you. I'm going to finish the session by opening up for your thoughts on this, because I'm sure that uh, many of you uh, know this passage and you probably have some thoughts you could share. The only thing, I mean, I could say a lot too, but the one thing I would like to just bring out is in verse 16, where it says, in all taking the shield of faith with, uh, with which, and I love this, you will be able to. That's just a great phrase. You will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. This equipment that we are to be putting on, it enables us to do well. We will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one if we have that shield of faith. We take it up, we engage in warfare, and we can see success, guys. You can be strong and overcome the enemy. And if John were to write to you, he'd say, I'm writing to you, young man, because you've overcome the wicked one. <laughs> you've overcome the wicked one. You've been laying hold on eternal life, and uh, you've been battling well. So what are your, any of your thoughts? We'll close with this. Uh, any thoughts that you guys would like to share about this passage and about, I'll put up another picture too. The same book. Same guy, is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts just on that? He says, put on the whole armor of God. I say, I, in my mind, that says, like, put your whole faith and your whole, like, body into the Lord himself. Mm -hmm. Give your whole, like, give yourself into Christ. Mm -hmm. And that will protect you from everything in your paths and so you actually have to meet him mm -hmm. that's what i get out of that mm -hmm. because yeah there's other places where it says put on the lord jesus christ and make no provision for the lust of the flesh put on the lord jesus christ or put on the new man so you're putting something on and here same idea with putting something on so there is a place for thinking about that way but it's neat to think of some of the specific things yeah patty um this goes to our tier in room team where it says Taking the shield of faith and where you can distinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. It just goes back to you earlier about fighting against my life and his life. The shield of faith. Yeah, that's yeah. Fight the good fight yeah, yeah. I'm sure the devil just hates to see someone confidently fighting, you know? He's just like so annoyed by that. <laughs> someone he's throwing fiery darts. You're like, <laughs> just your faith is strong. Anybody else? Let me give someone else a chance here. If anyone else wants to say, John? We'll just add to going back to verse 11. It's the whole armor of God, right? Mm. If you put on all of it, 
like we can't just as the Christian say, well, today I'm not going to gird my ways with truth. You yeah, know, yeah. I'll put on everything else. Yeah. You know, if you do that in battle, you know, it happens. You know, there's a weak spot, it could be the Achilles seal, and that uh, really be detrimental. So it's important yeah. to put on the whole armor of God. That's a great point. Yeah, put on the whole armor. That's a great point. Yeah. I like that, John. You're mixing Greek with that. Yeah. Anybody else? I, um, my thought, you know, um, is uh, something that I think sometimes I forget, right? Like, uh, if I think of fight, right, and I hear these uh, statements, right, that, you know, we do everything, you know, with God is to conquer our enemies. And um, a lot of times I forget the fact that God conquers the enemies through us. A lot of times I'll just like be struggling with the battle and then I'll just pray for God, like, hey, God, can you win this battle for me? And I don't do anything myself. Yeah, yeah. And it's important to remember that like we also have to be a part of battle and we can conquer it by uh, him through us. Amen. Great way to say it. Very good. Very good. Um also like when he says it will quench all the darts of the wicked one. So when I was younger, I had the uh, action Bible, mm -hmm. which is like the picture book of a Bible. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And yeah, I remember sure. saying like pictures. Yeah, I've given away that Bible to like so many people. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. It was like Did you get one? Three. Yeah. <laughs> I read Micah the, got one. Who else got one? I read <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> I read through it too. That's good. I remember... If those of you don't know what the Action Bible is, like check it out. It's like it's like comic book Bible. It's fantastic. Redraw a couple of pictures because it always says here in the when you get saved. It's like you're washed in the blood of the Lamb, and it quenches your sins out of your body. Like it washes your washes your sins out, and that quench the dark, the fiery darts of the wicked one. It's that blood of the Lamb and that wash the, the blood of the Lord, the blood of Jesus, kind of is like almost like a armor protecting you itself because that's what I think of. Mm. Well, when you're thinking about the shield of faith, it tells us what it is. It's a shield of faith. So what is it that we're holding up to deflect? It's the things that we believe, which God has told us. When we believe what God has told us, that is very powerful. It's when we doubt what God has told us or, you know, we're unsure of what God has told us that then we're vulnerable. But if we believe what God has told us and we believe in God himself, what Satan throws at us, it's really like it just it's just extinguished. But some of those things, like even Aiden, what you're saying, like what God has told us about our salvation, that we have been cleansed. If we believe that and that Satan throws some kind of dart at us, like we're going to hell, you know, we're a wicked person. Yeah. And we believe that we have been forgiven. We believe that that Christ's blood has been shed for us. That's like holding up the shield, man. Like that don't mean nothing to me. You can't get to me with that because I believe what God has said, I'm forgiven. His blood has cleansed me. So it's a, that's a good example of maybe a dart that might come our way that might make us feel like- It's like a one-way argument at that point. Once you have faith and once you actually believe, Saints just having a one way argument with himself. Yeah, yeah, I could just fall right to the hand. Yeah. yeah, Ezekiel. Oh, yeah, we got to go. We got to go eat. Yeah. I thought Ezekiel had a real deep comment for us, but he's just like, food. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you so much for your word. And it's so neat to see the way that things in the Old Testament and the way the New Testament, they just fit together just so beautifully. And we pray that we would catch a real vision of what you're inviting us to. And that Lord Jesus, that what we're being invited to is, is you, <laughs> to enter into and abide in you where all the blessings of God are. And, uh, and to know that if we're going to do that now, we're going to have to fight for it. But you will fight for us. We have to put on the armor and, and fight ourselves, but you are with us and you will give us the victory and we can go in and get fat <laughs> and just enjoy uh, all of your goodness. Um, we just thank you for allowing us to do this even before we get to heaven. So stir us up to this and give us a vision of this so uh, that uh, it's just clearly before us. Uh, we commit the rest of the day into your care. We love you. And Lord Jesus, we just ask these things in your name and for your namesake. Amen.